All right, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get started. So we started a uh, discussion yesterday, yeah, yesterday, about um, ventilation perfusion matching. So our, we introduced uh, the ventilation perfusion ratio, why we need things matched in terms of exchange of oxygen and CO2 between the blood and the atmospheric air. And then we started to talk a little bit about what then is in that alveolar space. We know what we breathed in. We know we saturated that water, or saturated that air with water, and then brought that air into the alveolus. But what is in the alveolus is not actually a reflection, a direct reflection on what we brought in. Right, so the air in the alveolus is not 150 millimeters of mercury PO2 and zero millimeters of mercury CO2. We were, we were thinking about why that might be. Okay, so drew a little bit of a picture about, to remind us about that we are always thinking about ventilation and perfusion at the same time, okay? And that one of the reasons why the oxygen and the CO2 in that alveolar space was not what we might think it is, was because oxygen is continually being removed by the blood and CO2 is continuing to be added by the blood if we're sitting in that alveolar space, okay? So then we might expect the alveolar space to have a lower oxygen and a higher CO2 than we might imagine because there's always diffusion happening. There's never a moment where we don't have flow across the lung. Second reason is that residual volume, right, that three liters when we breathed out normally and we realized there was about three liters in the lung at the end of a breath, well, that lung has already been equilibrated with blood, right, so, it's, so that alveolar space has already lost a bit of oxygen, uh, increased a little bit of CO2, and we never breathe that air out. So now the new fresh air that we breathe in is going to be a mixture of that. So we should actually see, or expect to see the oxygen in the alveolar space a little bit lower than 150 and the CO2 a bit higher than, a, than zero. And then the third reason why we should expect not to see 150 millimeters of mercury oxygen and zero CO2 is because of the first air that you breathe in is air that has already been at the alveolus. Okay, that dead space air. So when you breathe out, okay, we breathe out right now. Breathe out. Your trachea right now is filled with air that has already been in an alveolus. So now when you breathe in again, so breathe in right now, what's the first air that's entering all your alveoli? It's air that has already been in the alveoli, about 150 mils of it, that dead space air. That goes into the alveoli first. And then you bring some of that 350 mils fresh air in. Okay, so that alveolar oxygen and CO2 are going to be a mixture of air that has already been equilibrated with the blood and the new air you're bringing in. Okay, so let's, uh, we got ourselves to that point. So let's write that point down. That the third point is that dead space air. So this is previously equilibrated air is going to be the first air to enter the alveolus when you're inspiring, okay? Okay, so this air that's filling the trachea and the bronchioles has already been in the alveolus and already exchanged oxygen and CO2. So it's previously equilibrated. That air is the first air to enter the alveolus when inspiring. Okay, so three reasons why alveolar partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 are not what we might predict based on what we're breathing in, okay? Okay, so when we go back and look then 
at what is in there. We bring in this air saturated. We're mixing that with previously equilibrated residual volume. We're mixing that with the um, dead space air, and we're mixing that, or, and then we're um, constantly adding CO2 to this compartment and removing oxygen from that compartment, and we end up with an alveolar oxygen of 100 and an alveolar partial pressure of CO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so what we're looking at here actually is what has been equilibrated with the blood. So really critical point is, the point we talked about on Thursday, that blood always has enough time at the alveolus to equilibrate, okay? So if we can predict what is in the alveolus, that is what uh, the blood levels are at. So the game afoot in trying to figure out what are our blood levels of oxygen and CO2 leaving the lung is to try to figure out what are our alveolar CO2 and, uh, and oxygen. So if we can predict what that is, that we know that the blood had time to equilibrate with that, then we know what is about to head out to the left heart and to the rest of the body. Okay, so the game afoot is we're going to figure that out. We're going to build a tool to help us figure that out. There's a way that you can walk through it and talk your way through it, and there's a tool that we'll build in order to try to predict that. Okay? So we'll work on that today. Something else I was supposed to mention here was, oh yes, indeed. So we talk about pulmonary artery partial pressure of oxygen and pulmonary artery partial pressure of CO2 and pulmonary vein partial pressure of oxygen and CO2. This is not language that you will ever see anywhere, okay? Because so we're going to switch our language now. So because systemic venous oxygen and CO2 gets sent to the right heart and then just get pumped into the pulmonary arteries, that what we're going to find in the systemic veins is what we are going to find in the pulmonary arteries, then you will see the language is that pulmonary venous oxygen and CO2 come into the lung. So you will see people, or you will see in every textbook, them talk about um, PVO2 and PVCO2, knowing that they are exactly the same as pulmonary artery oxygen and pulmonary artery CO2. Okay, so we're just going to substitute that language up in here, because the oxygen and the CO2 never change. Okay, so you will see, and we're just, we're just about to inter, uh, be introduced to it in the next overhead, that when folks in the respiration field talk about what is the oxygen and CO2 coming to the lung, they talk about systemic venous oxygen and systemic venous CO2. Okay, so that's the language we're going to use. I'm going to substitute this in up here, right, because it's the same, it's the same thing. We just put it through a pump. Likewise, on the other side, you will never see textbooks or anything refer to uh, partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 in the pulmonary vein because that blood gets just dumped into a pump, which then gets pushed out to the uh, systemic arteries. You'll see this language sub substituted in for this language. Okay, so we're just going to switch out, and we will never speak of these again, but we will talk about PVO2 coming in. Uh, and PaO2 coming out, okay? So we're just going to switch that language because all other textbooks and references will use that language. So just so we're comfy with if you're reading outside here. Always have time to equilibrate, change in our language. Okay, so let's play with it a little bit. I think that's all I had on that. Let's play with it a little bit. So we're going to bring back our... VA over Q, ratio, and think then about how do we predict what is the partial, 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 the partial pressure, what is the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 in the alveolar space? Because then we can predict the partial, we know we're going to equilibrate with the blood, and then we can predict the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 that's about to be sent to the left heart and out to the body. And why do we care? 
Why do we care about that at all? Because oxygen and CO2 are regulated variables. Okay? Guess where the sensors are? They're on the systemic side, right after the left heart. So they're in the aorta and they're in the carotid arteries. So we are about to flow blood that has been oxygenated, that has oxygen and CO2 in it by sensors that will be monitoring that. And if oxygen and CO2 are not correct, there will be a negative feedback loop that we have to build those sensors into that are gonna change your respiration rate and depth of breathing to make oxygen and CO2 back to normal, okay? So the reason that we care about predicting what is in the alveolar space is because then we can predict what's in the blood space because that is about to flow by a sensor, okay? And as soon as we know what's about to flow by a sensor and we know how those sensors work, we know exactly what the body's gonna do with that oxygen and CO2 level, okay? So that's, that's where we're going here, that's what we're building. So we're gonna build this tool so we can predict oxygen and CO2 in the alveolar space to be able to predict oxygen and CO2 in the blood, okay? That's what all this is about. So if we were to think about where we've been under our normal ventilation perfusion um, scenario, right, we had a VA, talked about a VA over Q ratio that's normal. And that was breathing in a PO2 of 150 millimeters of mercury and a PCO2 of about zero. Okay, so that's just grabbing that, dry, that hydrated air that we were breathing in. That was coming in and that was getting mixed up with all that other stuff we just talked about. Equilibrating and we have our PaO2, so our partial pressure of uh, oxygen in the alveolus being 100 millimeters of mercury and our partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolus being 40. Okay, so we're just grabbing those numbers. We've just been talking about those. Okay, the blood, our venous blood, so this was PVO2. Okay, that PVO2, which is that pulmonary artery O2, so here we're changing the language. That PVO2 coming back with low oxygen, high CO2. Okay, so this is our blood, PVCO2, being 40 and 45. Okay, so those are the numbers that were just taken from the discussion we had with my little hand-drawn alveolus. Okay. And then we know that we would equilibrate with this space, right? So this blood coming by would equilibrate with here so that we then can predict that our systemic artery uh, partial pressure of oxygen would have been 100 millimeters of mercury. And our systemic artery partial pressure of CO2 being 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so those are just all those normal basal metabolic rate numbers that we had before. Okay, just transported over to here. And we would have a happy, normal VA over Q ratio. Okay? So let's take two extremes then. Let's say, what if we stopped ventilation in one scenario? What would happen? And what if we stopped flow in another scenario? What would happen to alveolar oxygen and CO2? Okay, so two extremes. Let's start with uh, ventilation. So let's say we had no ventilation. Super bad day. VA over Q, our ratio, uh, no ventilation would be, so we would have the numerator at zero. We would have flow. So this ratio now is tending to get very small. So this ratio is now tending towards zero. Okay, so this ratio is getting little. We're tending towards zero. That's what our ratio would be doing. So in the scenario where we suddenly have no respiration and we're bringing in our PVO2 of, uh, PVO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury, okay, and we're bringing in our normal PVCO2 of 45 millimeters of mercury, that if, like, so what does ventilation do? Ventilation brings in oxygen to that space and it gets rid of CO2. So suddenly we stopped bringing in oxygen 
and stop getting rid of CO2, and we continued to flow blood by. So blood, would what, what does blood do from that compartment? Blood removes oxygen and adds CO2, so that if we let this run long enough, then the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 in the alveolar space would then mimic what we're equilibrating with, right? Those two compartments would eventually equilibrate with each other if we're not refreshing the input, okay? We're not refreshing the input, so we just eventually equilibrate with that blood space. So on the output side of things, so let's go down here. On the output side of things, we would fully expect to see an arterial O2 of 40 millimeters of mercury and a CO2 of 45, okay? So as the ventilation perfusion ratio gets really small, oxygen went down, CO2 went up, okay? Oxygen went down, CO2 went up. Okay, let's take the other extreme. Let's say we're gonna block flow and allow ventilation to continue, okay? Another super bad day. So I got no flow going. What's happening to my ventilation perfusion ratio with no flow? I have normal ventilation but no flow. So now this ratio just got really, really big. So this ratio, now the number, instead of being closer to zero, is now tending towards infinity. It's getting really, really big. Okay, so we're tending towards infinity, tending towards a very large ratio. Okay, so then what would happen in that case? So we have no flow coming by. All right, so what would happen with, uh, what does, we continue to replenish the oxygen and remove the CO2 by ventilation. Right? But we stop removing oxygen from this compartment by flow, and we stop adding CO2 to this compartment by flow. So if we stop adding CO2 and we stop removing oxygen, eventually, as you continue to breathe in and out and in and out and in and out, the alveolar PO2 and alveolar CO2 will reflect more of what you're breathing in. Okay, because you're not removing anything from that compartment, you're just replenishing it. And if you're just replenishing the compartment, it will eventually, over time, look a whole lot like what we were breathing in, because you're not removing anything, okay? So we would eventually then leave, if we had a little bit of flow, I guess, because we can't really leave unless we've got a bit of flow. We would then have a PaO2 where the oxygen has gone up, and a CO2 or oxygen has gone, or CO2 has gone down, okay? Our blood compartment would equilibrate with that, and we would have a PaO2 equaling 150 millimeters of mercury, I don't know if you can see it that. And a PaCO2 equaling zero. Okay, two extreme cases. So now let's plot all of those ideas on one tool. Okay, so all we're gonna do is take all of these ideas and plot them on one set of axes. Okay, so down here. So what we have, plotting them against partial pressure of oxygen and CO2, and these axes could be alveolar oxygen, but because we always equilibrate with alveolar oxygen, this could also be systemic artery oxygen, right? Because we're equilibrating, right? It's exactly what we did up here. Anytime we had something in here, we equilibrated with it and that was what it was on the output, right? 110 or 140, we equilibrated with that. Increase oxygen, decrease CO2, we equilibrated with that. Okay, so the oxygen and the CO2 axes here could be alveolar or systemic artery. Similarly, P CO2 could be um, alveolar or systemic blood. Okay, so we're gonna plot then those three points that we have. 
right? These three, we've got three sets of data here, right? Where our VA over Q ratio was normal, we had a PO2 of 100 and a PCO2 of 40. So 100 and 40, boom, there we're at, okay? And that was with our normal VA over Q ratio. Perfect. What was our other data set? The other data set was when there was no ventilation. So when the VA over Q ratio got really small, okay. so we had a VA over Q ratio where we decreased ventilation, okay, where VA over Q tends towards zero. We had a PAO2 of 40 and a PACO2 of 45, so 40 and 45, boom, there it is. Okay, so we're just plotting the data. And finally, when we had no flow in the system, so we had a VA over Q ratio that was getting really big, tending towards infinity, so an increase in flow, no, super bad, a make that go away. A decrease in flow. When we had a decrease in flow, the ratio started to get really big. We had an increase in oxygen, so we had a PaO2 of 150, boom, and a PaCO2 of zero. So we just plotted those ideas onto one graph, okay? Just translated that. Now the cool thing is, is you could also do the opposite scenarios. There's two ways to get your ventilation perfusion ratio to go small. You can increase the numerator, or uh, decrease the numerator, or increase the denominator. So the same will be true. The same alveolar oxygen and CO2 changes will occur if your numerator stays constant, but your denominator goes up. That's another way to get your VA over Q ratio tending towards zero. So if you've got an increased flow problem, we now can read off the graph exactly where, what alveolar oxygen and CO2 will do, and then we will be able to get arterial oxygen and, C, uh, oxygen and CO2, okay? Very similar for making the VA over Q ratio really big. We can decrease the numerator or increase the denominator. So let me say that the other way around. We can decrease the denominator or increase the numerator. Okay? Look what I wrote, not what I said. How about that? It's a good rule for Friday. Okay? So there's two ways that we can mess with the VA over Q ratio to get it really big. So now we know if we were to decrease flow, if we had a decreased flow scenario and breathing was okay, I'm going to have a PaO2 uh, of 150 and a, PA, and a PaCO2 of zero. Likewise, if ventilation went up and flow didn't, we're in the same scenario. Okay? So if you keep track of the VA over Q ratio, it helps you out a little bit. Okay? All right, so then let's use this tool to solve some problems so you can flex your muscle a little bit on how this tool might be helpful, okay? Or whether you want to drop it like it's hot and just talk your way through these problems. I try to talk my way through these problems and I get mistakes all the time, so I tend to like to use the graph, but feel free to express yourself in any way as long as you uh, get your arrows right. Okay, so let's try then an example of hyperventilation, okay? Let's go through that example. Hyperventilation. Ventilation is too high. In terms of my VA over Q ratio, that's what it's telling me, right? Ventilation is too high. So my ratio is getting real big. Okay, the game of foot, predict the changes in alveolar oxygen and CO2. 
Okay, that's what we need to do. We can predict the gases in the alveolar space, and we can predict the gases in the blood space, because we always have time to equilibrate with what's in that alveolar space, right? So let's talk our way through it first, and we will do this slowly so I don't get you messed up. So ventilation, so let's think about what ventilation and flow do, if we're gonna talk our way through this. What do ventilation and flow do to the alveolar space? Because that's what we care about. So what does ventilation do to the alveolar space? Ventilation adds oxygen, all right, and removes CO2. from that alveolar space. Okay, that's what ventilation does to that alveolar space. What does flow do to the alveolar space? Flow adds CO2 and removes oxygen, right? Good. So now, if we think our way through this, if I were to increase ventilation, so I'm going to increase ventilation. So now I'm just going to think about what that's going to do for um, oxygen. If I increase ventilation, I'm going to add more oxygen than I'm removing by flow. Right? So if I increase ventilation, I'm going to add more oxygen by ventilation than then removing by flow. So if I'm adding more oxygen than I'm removing, I should expect to see alveolar oxygen go up. Right? Does that make sense? I'm adding more oxygen than I'm removing. So PaO2 should go up. And if I know PaO2, then I got systemic arterial oxygen nailed. If I get one, we have enough time to equilibrate. I know the other. Why do I care? Because now I know what oxygen is about to flow by my sensors. Okay. So, let's think about the CO2 argument now. CO2 removed, or uh, ventilation removed CO2, and flow adds CO2. Okay, so in this case, I'm I will be, and I'm increasing ventilation, so I'm going to rem be removing more CO2. By ventilation, then I'm adding by flow, removing more CO2. God, problematic today. Removing more CO2 by ventilation than adding by oxygen, so my PA CO2 should go down. And if I've got my alveolar CO2, then I know my systemic arterial CO2. Okay, I've got that one nailed. Does that make sense? So when you talk your way through it, that's how we have to do it. Okay? Or we can already be convinced that this is true because of our last little discussion that it would be true, and use the graph. So if I've got a relationship that looks something like this between O2 and CO2, and my normal VA over Q ratio sits about there, 
And this is what happens when it ten, the VA over Q ratio gets small. This is what happens when the VA over Q, Q ratio gets big. And suddenly we were to say, boom, my VA over Q ratio is getting really big. I'm headed this way. Okay? PaO2 went down, or PaCO2 went down, PaO2 went up. Okay? So we had a VA over Q ratio that was tending towards something big. So I'm going to just read off the graph now. I'm going to increase my PaO2, therefore increase my systemic artery O2. And just reading off the graph, that means I'm going to drop my PaCO2. And then I can know, equilibrate with that, decrease my systemic artery CO2. Okay? Both ways we get to the same, we get to the same result. Okay? So you can either use the VA or use the VA over Q tool or talk your way through it. It's all good. Okay? Are we okay with that? Try another one. Ventilation is one that's a little easier to talk your way through because it kind of makes a little more inherent sense. It's when we change the denominator where suddenly things get a little bit wonky, okay? So let's try to change the denominator. First of all, I do want you to try, try a decrease in ventilation. It's the exact opposite of this, so I'm totally confident you'll get it once you walk your way through it, okay? So try a drop in ventilation. Okay, so then let's change the denominator. Because for me, it's where the denominator, uh, changing the denominator where things don't always seem as intuitive as they should. So let's increase flow. Okay. So how could we increase flow? Um, across the pulmonary system? Anybody have any thoughts on how that might actually happen? or Because this is a physiologically relevant thing. You've been changing flow? Yeah. Yeah. So... What has to happen to the right heart? So if you increase cardiac output of the right heart, exactly. So any time that we've been messing with the cardiovascular mechanics problems, and you've been increasing mean circulatory filling pressure, increasing venous return, increased cardiac output of the right heart, and you started to increase flow across the lung, right? You've, we've done this argument four, five, six times. You were changing flow across the pulmonary capillary bed. And that had a consequence on oxygen and CO2. At the time, we just cared about what volume, what, what consequences we had regarding volume. We are now going to add a consequence in terms of changing oxygen and CO2 because changing flow across the lung changes oxygen and CO2 on the, on the other side. Okay? So let's go through that example. So indeed, any time that we, we could increase flow or if we altered, if we increase cardiac output of the right heart, Okay, and we did this in many ways. We changed mean circulatory filling pressure. Uh, we changed heart rate. Right? Changing heart rate would have changed cardiac output of the right heart uh, when we messed with contractility. So just know that if you want to practice these types of examples, go back to your cardiovascular mechanics examples where you were messing with flow all the time and see if now you can predict how you would have messed with oxygen and CO2 based on those examples. So in left heart failure, we've been hammering away at left heart failure for a while now, there was an oxygen and CO2 consequence to left heart failure, okay? So go back and check that. As examples to kind of flex your muscle, to um, solve problems because you know what's coming on midterms and final exams, right? You know the stuff is coming. Every time I give you a tool, I want you to use it. You know what's coming. Okay, so 
lots of ways for you to get some practice material there. Okay, so increased flow. I like to think about my VA over Q ratio. Increase my denominator, so my ratio is going to get small. Okay, my ratio is now going to tend towards zero. Okay, so we'll talk our way through it first. So flow, what does flow do to the alveolar space? It adds CO2 and removes O2. from that alveolar space, because this is where I'm just repeating exactly what we had in terms of the problem on, of uh, hyperventilation, just to get it down here so we don't mess up. So ventilation, what does ventilation do to the alveolar space? It adds oxygen. And removes CO2. So, in a scenario where I increase flow, I'm just thinking about, what I got here, CO2. If I'm just thinking about CO2, I'm going to add, what is, if I increase flow, I'm going to add more CO2 than I'm removing by ventilation. If I'm adding more CO2 than I'm removing by ventilation, I should expect to see an increase in alveolar CO2, and then I can predict what's in the blood. Okay, when I'm thinking about oxygen, flow removes oxygen from the alveolar space, so I'm going to remove more oxygen than I'm adding by ventilation. Okay, make sense? If I'm removing more oxygen than I'm adding by ventilation, I should expect to see my alveolar oxygen go down and therefore my systemic artery oxygen will go down. Okay? Make sense? We can predict that by talking our way through it. Or we can think about the tool. I get a relationship between oxygen and CO2 as the VA over Q ratio tends between zero and infinity. Under normal conditions, I'm here. My VA over Q ratio tended towards zero. I'm there. Now I just read the graph. As my ratio tended towards zero, oxygen went down. And CO2 went up. So from there I can predict uh, arterial oxygen and arterial CO2. Okay? That's how we're going to use this tool, this relationship. Okay? I would highly recommend that you try this example for the decrease in flow, because once you've seen an increase in ventilation and a decrease in ventilation, and an increase in flow and a decrease in flow, that's all there can be. There is no other combination or permutation that can happen, okay? You will have answers to all the things that I could possibly ask, all right? So we will be bringing this tool back.
when we try to predict what's happening in the blood space when we're thinking about sensors, okay? So at the moment, right, we've been talking about messing with oxygen and CO2 in the blood, and that blood, I'm telling you, is about to head out towards sensors. So we gotta know how we're carrying this oxygen and this CO2 in the blood, okay? So we gotta know a little bit about our oxygen and CO2 carrying capacity. So we're just gonna bring back a little bit from what you know about uh, hemoglobin from biochemistry. So what I'm doing here is nothing new. We do need to think though now about how How do we carry How do we carry oxygen and CO2 in the blood? Um, so our basal uh, resting or uh, oxygen consumption, we have to think about So, just sitting there, binge watching Netflix, your oxygen consumption will be about 250 mils per minute, okay? So, this whole system now has to be built to be able to deliver 250 mils of oxygen per minute. That's just at rest. If you start doing something, we gotta find a way to deliver more, okay? So we talked about a PaO2 of 100, right? So that was the numbers that we've been playing with under normal uh, lung VA over Q ratio lung perfusions, right? So if you were to look then at how much oxygen you can carry in the blood at 100 millimeters of mercury PO2, we're looking at uh, three three mils of oxygen dissolved in the plasma. We have three mils, we need 250, it's not enough. So we gotta invent something then, the body has to evolve. If it's gonna be as big as all this and as complicated as all this, then we have to evolve some system to be able to carry more oxygen, okay? So hence we have hemoglobin, in red blood cells to do this for us. Right, you know this, this now, this hemoglobin in red blood cells plus that dissolved in our plasma will give us enough. The hemoglobin will give us about 65 times um, what we need, so there's gonna be about 65 times more oxygen Um, then plasma alone, okay? So we've got really, really good carrying capacity now. But there's a problem. When we chose to, dis when we chose, chose, when we evolved to carry, to bind oxygen to hemoglobin, oxygen bound to hemoglobin. Oxygen bound to hemoglobin is bound to hemoglobin. It's not available for tissue, right? Only the oxygen in, dissolved in the plasma is, avail, is available for diffusion to get to a piece of tissue. Oxygen bound to hemoglobin is oxygen trapped on hemoglobin, okay? It's not available for diffusion. So good for us, we can carry it, but now we have to devise systems to try to convince hemoglobin to give up oxygen at the right time. So we need to create an environment so that oxygen binds to hemoglobin at the level of the lung, great idea. But once it gets down to the level of the tissue, you gotta, ask, you gotta want it to give it up, okay? So hemoglobin then has to be this real, is this really cool molecule that reversibly binds to oxygen. This is critical for life. If hemoglobin did not reversibly bind oxygen, we would bind oxygen to hemoglobin and that would be it. We have to reversibly bind it because we gotta get oxygen off at the right place and put it on at the right place. 
So super critical is that O2 binds reversibly to hemoglobin. Okay, oxygen binds, binds reversibly to hemoglobin. So just to write down, I guess what I said there, that oxygen bound to hemoglobin is unavailable to tissues. It's only the dissolved oxygen in plasma, so that PaO2 that we've been talking about, that's available to tissues. Okay, so the game afoot is going to be how do we how do we convince oxygen how do we convince oxygen to come off hemoglobin at the right spot and bind to it at the right spot. Oh, and that's a longer discussion. So let's cut it there and have a good weekend. So that's will this will end like the material that will be on the midterm. End of today, all fair game for the midterm. Tuesday's lecture won't be on the midterm. Okay?